recollections of a faded beauty. Ah, I remember when I was a girl, how my hair naturally used to curl, and how my aunt four yards of net would pucker, and call the odious thing Diana's tucker. I hated it, because although, you see, it did for her, it didn't do for me. Popkin said I should wear a low corsage, but this, I know, was merely badinage. I recollect the gaieties of old, ices when hot, and punch when we were cold. Race balls and country balls, and balls where you, for seven shillings, got dance and supper too. Oh, I remember all the routs and plays, but words are idle, as Lord Byron says, and so am I, and therefore can spare time to put my recollections into rhyme. I recollect the man who did declare, when I was at the fair, myself was fair. I had it in my album for three years, and often looked and shed delicious tears. I didn't fall in love, however, then, because I never saw that man again. And I remember Popkins, ah, too well, and all who once in love with Chloe fell. They called me Chloe, for they said my grace was nymph-like, as was also half my face. My mouth was wide, but then I had a smile which might a demon of its tears beguile. As Captain Popkins said, or rather swore, he liked me, ah, my Popkins, all the more. He couldn't bear a little mouth, for when it laughed, Twas like a long slit in a pen, or buttonhole stretched on too big a button, or little cut for gravy in boiled mutton. Popkins was clever, but I must proceed more regularly that my friends may read. I didn't marry, for I couldn't get a man I liked, I haven't got one yet, but I had handsome lovers by the score. Alas, alas, I always sighed for more. First came young Minton of the Ninth Hussars. His eyes were bright and twinkling as the stars. There was, indeed, a little, little cast, but he assured me that it would not last, and only came when he, one cold bivouac, gazed on the foe and could not turn it back. The chill was so intense. Poor Minton, I really did think he certainly would die. He gave me of himself a little print. The painter did not see or heed the squint. Squint it was not, but one eye sought the other with tenderness, as twere a young twin brother. He gave it, and he sighed. Oh, often after, the memory of that sigh hath chilled my laughter. I'm sure I might have married him, but then I never did enough encourage men, and somehow he made love to Anna Budge. I never owed the ugly minx a grudge, though God knows she was cross and plain enough. The things he used to say to her, such stuff. Then came young Frederick Mortimer de Vaux, a cruel, faithless wretch that worked me woe. But such a man, so tall, so straight, he took a lady's heart away at every look. Such a hooked nose, such loads of curly hair, such a pale, wild, intense, Byronic air, and his whole soul, as he himself has said, wandering about among the mighty dead. He had read books, and rather liked to show it, and always spoke like an inspired poet, Last time we met, my heart prophetic drew a mournful omen from his wild adieu. I wrote it down when he had closed the door. All I remembered, would it had been more. Allah, who shall I ever behold thee again? Sweet cause of my transport, dear cause of my pain. Alhamdu il ilah, what place can be fair? 
my rose of the desert, if thou art not there. Yet I go, for stern duty compels me to do so, from the world where my heart is, like far-banished Crusoe. Girls' gardens invite me, but fate says, depart. Bismillah, farewell, young Heidi of my heart. Was it not beautiful? It was, ah me. Who would have thought such lips could traitors be? Who could have thought, who saw his bright eye burn? He spoke, intending never to return. Then Mr. Humley asked Aunt's leave to wed, and winked and asked if love was in my head or heart, and then proceeding things to settle, helping my aunt the while to lift the kettle, said, you shall have a cosy home, my dear, and fifty pounds to buy you clothes a year. And we must get your aunt or some kind fairy to teach you how to churn and mind the dairy. A cosy home? Why did one ever hear of such a man? And to call me my dear? Me? I was Frederick Mortimer's heart's Heidi. Young Minton's star of hope and gladness, me. But I refused him, though my aunt did say that it was an advantage thrown away. He an advantage? That she'd make me rue it, make me a nun. I'd like to see her do it. Down, down, rebellious heart, I am a nun, at least the same as if I had been one. I do repent I thought myself too comely. I do repent I am not Mrs. Humley. Then, cold and cautious, came young Archie Campbell, full many a sunset walk and pleasant ramble I took with him, but I grew weary soon, because, instead of turning from the moon to gaze on me, he bade me look with him, and wondered when her light would grow more dim, and the world fade away. I should have tired before our honeymoon had half expired. Oh, loved when first I met thee, and forever, Thou from whom cold caprice hath made me sever. Where art thou, Popkins? Captain Popkins? Oh, dear recollection and delicious woe. Most generous, most genteel, O oh, thou, alas, Of the best class and better than thy class. Where art thou? Ah, it matters not to me. By Chloe's side thou never more shalt be. How sweetly didst thou sing those evening bells, Still the dear echo in my bosom swells. How gaily didst thou dance, how clearly whistle, How neatly fold each elegant epistle. How thin thy pumps were, and how bright thy boot, T'was that brought Warren's blacking in repute. How nameless was thy majesty of form, Making each man look like a wriggling worm, that dared beside thy shoulders broad expanse to venture his lank shape. By what sweet chance did all that would have been defects in others, whom yet you deemed your fellow men and brothers, turn to perfection when beheld in you, though short yet graceful, fat but active too. He wrote, adored, proposed. Some cursed power bade me nip off his young hope's budding flower. I did not even answer that sweet letter, because I thought, perhaps, I'd get a better. Oh, Chloe, tear thy hair and beat thy breast. How couldst thou get a better than the best? Tis over now the agony and despair with which I beat that breast. Unmeaning note of cold adieu Mixed with reproach was all my silence drew Gone and forever I could scarce believe it Surely he wrote and I did not receive it Vain hope He went He was my heart's one love All other men All other loves above I would have married him without a penny Each lover after him was one too many. 
There was a certain Irishman, indeed, who borrowed Cupid's darts to make me bleed. My aunt said he was vulgar, he was poor, and his boots creaked and dirtied her smooth floor. She hated him, and when he went away, he wrote, I have the verses to this day. We're us through, then, my beautiful jewel, I'm quite tired out of my life. I can't fight with fortune the duel, I cannot have you for a wife. The beauties of nature adorning no longer afford me delight. In the night, oh, I wish it were morning, in the morning I wish it were night. For your aunt, she has writ me a letter, oh then, she's a sad, dirty rogue. Does she think other men love you better because I've a bit of the brogue? In regard to the fighting and swearing, sure, Jewel, it's all for the best. Just to drown all the grumbling and cheering that gives my poor stomach no rest. Small work I've had late at the garden, less than none I can't have anyhow. And he wouldn't deny when he's starving, your daddy a bit of a row. Then good night to you, love, or good morrow. It's all just the same which I say For the differ is small to my sorrow When one gets neither breakfast nor tea Now was this vulgar which was said or sung Or but the lingering of his native tongue In ears which thought it music Being such as he had known in childhood's early years What time we suffer little and hope much and oft turned back to gaze upon with tears. I liked him, and I liked his verses. But in some vile squabble as to where he put his walking stick, and whether sticks were stronger for being cut on Irish ground or longer, he lost his life, and I my last real love. For though a few still round me used to rove, whether they had not half his sense and merit, I never have loved since with any spirit. End of section 27